Luke 23, 55. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed along and observed the tomb and how his body was placed. Then when they returned and prepared spices and perfumes, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women were with them, telling the apostles these things. But their words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up, and ran to the tomb. When he stooped in, he only saw the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. We're going to be looking at the rest of 24, so keep your Bibles open at that point. Uh, Before we begin, uh, let me pray. Uh, Good God, thank you for today. Uh, Father, thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to die on the cross. Uh, And Holy Spirit, help us to hear your word and open uh, our hearts to what you would have us hear. I praise you, uh, Lord God, uh, for raising Christ from the dead. Uh, Thank you that we can celebrate that today. Amen. Uh, recently, I've loved watching a show called Ted Lasso. Uh, it's uh, quite a funny show. Uh, the show centers around a character called Ted, and he is an American football coach uh, who gets brought over to the UK to coach an English football team. Uh, now, in one particular scene, Ted is playing a game of darts against kind of the show's bad guy. Uh, It's a crucial moment in the game. Uh, Ted has his last three throws, and he needs a lot of points. Uh, There's been a lot of banter going on between Ted uh, and Rupert, the show's bad guy. And just before he throws his first dart, he he recalls a quote he read graffitied on a wall. Uh, It said, Be curious, not judgmental. Rupert, the show's bad guy had been judgmental, uh, assuming that Ted was just an overly confident, bumbling yank. Had he been curious, as Ted points out, he might have learned that Ted had played darts every Sunday afternoon with his father for many years and was far more proficient than he seemed. Uh, This idea of being curious or open-minded in many ways sums up our current culture. Uh, that encourages people to be open-minded to new situations, new ways of thinking, uh, to try something new or to be open to new ideas. And the same can be said about Easter. Do we come in to Easter with our own preconceived ideas uh, regarding Jesus, who he is, or what he's done? Or do we come to the Easter story with an open mind, listening to what Jesus says about himself in the Bible. Uh, So Luke, that we've just read from, uh, the author of this biography of Jesus' life and ministry, he takes great care in providing uh, his readers with facts. At the very start of the book, 
Luke records how he has carefully investigated everything from the beginning and that he writes to a guy called Theophilus, uh, possibly a middle-class Roman official, wanting him to have certainty of the things that he has been taught, a certainty of his faith in Jesus. Luke does this through uh, while recording Jesus' life, and the resurrection is no different. Luke provides more detail as Resurrection uh, Sunday unfolds. So as you follow along, we're going to be looking at the resurrection in three main sections. A possibility, so the events at the tomb. Probability, the discussion with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And actuality, back at the room with all of the disciples. Each scene or section uh, opens... um, Each scene or section is similar to the next uh, and builds on the previous. And with each uh, something or someone is open to the reality of Jesus' resurrection. There's also an emphasis in each section on the faithfulness of God in fulfilling his promises, but perhaps in unexpected ways. Uh, So point one or point two on your outline, the tomb. Already we've been introduced to a number of characters. The women who came to the tomb early that morning were there when Jesus was placed in the tomb on Friday afternoon. They would have seen how Jesus was wrapped in cloths. They would have seen Jesus' lifeless body placed on the cold stone. There was no doubt who they were coming to see, and there was no doubt as to which tomb they were going to. Uh, Verse 1 of 24, it's the first day of the week and the women come to the tomb with an expectation that Jesus' body would still be there. Instead of finding his body, they find the tomb open. They expected the tomb to be closed for Jesus' body to be inside. Otherwise, Otherwise, why else did they bring spices to anoint his body? Perhaps this is the same for you. Coming to Easter closed to the idea that Jesus might be alive. Coming with the expectation of a closed tomb. For the women, they had forgotten what Jesus had said to them on at least three occasions during his ministry. Three occasions foreshadowing his death, but also his resurrection. For the women at the tomb... And as well for us, the best antidote to misunderstanding who Jesus is, is to remember his teaching. Uh, Verse 4, two men in dazzling clothes, who we are only later told are angels, proclaim this amazing news. He is not here. He has risen. They remind the women what Jesus said, that it was necessary for the Son of Man to be crucified. And on the third day, rise. That there would be suffering, but there would also be vindication. When these women go back to the disciples, understandably they are met with a bit of scepticism. They're returning with this amazing news, and they think it's nonsense. But as they'll discover, the evidence of Jesus' resurrection grows throughout the day. The women have heard how Jesus has been raised. They have remembered his words. Could this actually have happened? If the absence of Jesus' body and hearing from the two men raised the possibility of Jesus' resurrection, the third section strengthens the probability that, that he has indeed been raised. As we move into the second of our three sections, the focus shifts Uh, Verse 13, Uh, it moves, it focuses on two disciples walking away from Jerusalem, taking the seven-mile hike to Emmaus. Uh, And again, Luke grounds his account in historical and verifiable evidence. These two disciples are quite discouraged. 
the person they'd been following for a number of years and in whom they'd placed their hope for a restored Israel was dead. Now, it's at this point that Jesus himself comes near and starts walking beside them. I think it's a a beautiful image that in their discouragement and bewilderment, the very person they are grieving for and longing for comes alongside them to guide them back to a right understanding of who they trusted. At this point, though, they are prevented from recognising Jesus. Now, the Gospel accounts aren't all um, facts. Uh, There is a bit of humour involved. And I think we see this in this account. Uh, Jesus is a bit coy with these disciples. Uh, He comes up and asks them what they've been discussing. Uh, One of the disciples, named Cleopas, says, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's been going on? The irony, of course, is Jesus does know what's going on. Uh, He's the only one who can know fully what the crucifixion was like. Now, these disciples, they talk to Jesus about what they're discussing. They identify Jesus, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who was a a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all people. Uh, So verse 19 and 20, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. These two disciples are so close to understanding who Jesus is, but like so many, they don't fully grasp the extent of Jesus' mission. They recognise the facts of the gospel, but they don't recognise the face of the gospel. What they were hoping for was potentially a political leader, someone who would boot the Romans out to restore Israel to its former glory, independent and strong. In verse 21 they say, but we were hoping that he was the one who was about to redeem Israel. What Jesus offers and what he achieves on the cross is much more significant than what they could have hoped for. Just as the women had assumed Jesus would be dead, these disciples have a misplaced understanding as to who Jesus is. He isn't just another prophet or a good teacher or a miracle worker. And I wonder if we can be a bit the same Maybe we come to Jesus thinking he's a bit like a lawnmower. He clears a path for us to make our life happy and good. Perhaps it's a desk calendar Jesus, a wise saying for each day of the week. Or perhaps it's Jesus as mate, someone to have a good chin wag with, but not someone that you would call Lord, and certainly not someone who would have control over your life. Don't assume the Jesus you want or the Jesus you imagine is the same as the one revealed in the Bible. To redirect the disciples, Jesus explains to them that it was necessary for the Messiah or God's chosen one to suffer and enter into glory. He then opens up the whole of the scriptures to them to see that it concerns himself. Again, if you want a bit of humour, you know, imagine that Bible study. It's a long walk with Jesus explaining from Genesis to Malachi how all of it points to him. Their whole history was pointing to Jesus. God had promised to rescue and redeem his people, just as the disciples had said, but it was done in a way that they didn't expect. Jesus didn't come to restore Israel uh, into prosperity or to come and restore the city of Jerusalem. He had come to deal with a far deeper and darker issue than just who was going to be the political leader of the day. But we'll come to that in the next section. The possibility of Jesus being alive becomes far greater probability when the disciples share a meal with Jesus. 
Just as Jesus demonstrated during the Passover meal, the breaking of bread as being symbolic of his body being broken on the cross, he again breaks bread and gives it to the disciples. At this point, the disciples understand who their traveller is. It is none other than Jesus himself. Their eyes are open to the, pos- to the reality that was before them, that Jesus had indeed been raised, just as he said, and just as the scriptures had foretold. With this good news, they travel back to Jerusalem. They take the seven-mile hike that they've just accomplished back to share with the other disciples what they have seen and heard, confirming what the women have already told them. Just as with the women at the open tomb, these disciples have been reminded that what took place just days before was no accident, was no plan B, but that it was necessary that Jesus had to suffer before he was raised in glory. Jesus opened the scriptures and so opened their eyes to recognize Jesus for who he really is, the suffering servant who would be vindicated and brought back to life, as we heard from Isaiah 53 earlier. Jesus didn't come in power and brute strength, but rather as a humble servant, willingly going to the cross in order to save and rescue. Uh, In all reality, I think that had Jesus have shown up early in the morning to all the disciples, I don't think they would have coped. Uh, The women were terrified just at the sight of the angels at the tomb. Jesus is being gentle with his followers as he readjusts and completely reorientates their whole world view. But he's not done yet. One last scene to go to help the disciples move from probability of Jesus being alive to having assurance that he has been truly raised from the dead, to understand why he came and the implication that that has for us today. So we're at point four on the outline. Having already experienced Uh, being exposed to the probability of Jesus being alive, in verse 37, the disciples are startled and terrified when Jesus himself stands in their midst. Uh, They think they are seeing a ghost. Jesus wants to reassure his disciples that he isn't something of their grief-stricken imagination, that he stands in front of them bodily, physically, that they can reach out and touch him. Verse 39, he says, look at my hands and my feet. It's me. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones. He says, see, touch my hands, touch my feet, where the nails pierced my flesh. And to cap it off, he takes food and eats in front of them. Can a ghost do that? He's saying. Jesus is met with mixed emotions. They're amazed. They're in disbelief. And all because of their joy of seeing him before them. Could this really be true? The women earlier in the morning had said so. The disciples on the road had just been explaining that they had just met Jesus. And now Jesus was standing among them. Not as some spiritual being, but in full humanity. In a body untouched by death. Not abandoned to the grave, nor left to see decay. For the, t- for the third time now, Jesus explains that this should not be a surprise to them. That, ha- that he had already explained to them that what was written in the scriptures, so in the Old Testament must be fulfilled. The plan hadn't changed. God was merely doing what he had promised long ago. God had faithfully kept his promise to redeem his people. In the final opening of this passage, Jesus opens their minds 
to show them that the whole of Scripture has been pointing to him and how God has been working to this end. We've seen the women coming to the open tomb, Jesus opening up the Scriptures with the two disciples to show them that he is the Messiah that would come and then opens their eyes to see that he is the one that they have been seeking, mourning the loss of and walking alongside Finally, Jesus opens the minds of the disciples to who he is and why he came. Jesus didn't come to restore Israel geopolitically, to be a political leader, to overthrow the Romans, but so that people could be forgiven. Jesus knew that Israel's biggest issue, that my my biggest issue, that your biggest issue, that everyone's biggest issue isn't social or political reform. The deeper and darker issue is sickness. A sickness from sin. Sin that corrupts. Sin that decays. A sin that says the uh, attitude that says that we are God and God is not. God knew that we couldn't deal with our sin on our own, but that we needed something or someone outside of ourselves to come in and rescue us. God had promised that he would redeem humanity and he sent Jesus to take our place. On Friday, we were confronted with Jesus' death on the cross and asked, who do we identify with? The scoffers, the mourners, or the thief on the cross? who acknowledges who Jesus is as the one who can save. Now, today we celebrate Jesus risen from the grave, showing once and for all that the consequence of sin, that death, has been overcome, that there is no longer any fear of death for those who trust in Jesus. As the forerunner of our faith, Jesus has opened the way for all who believe to come into a right relationship with God. Jesus' mission was not political, but came to seek and save the lost. This is the hallmark of the Christian faith, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and that for those who repent, in Jesus' name there is forgiveness of sin. The tomb was open and empty, The scriptures were open and fulfilled. Their eyes were opened and they recognized. Their minds were open and they believed. In our culture that encourages open-mindedness, do we come to Jesus with our own expectations and assumptions, closed to the idea of an empty tomb? Or do we come open to meeting Jesus as he has revealed himself in the Bible? Are you open to the reality of the risen Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Now, Heavenly Father, thank you that you did not uh, let your Holy One see decay nor abandon him to the grave, but in power you rose him from the gra- dead. Now, the grave could not hold him. I thank you, Father, that we can be forgiven Uh, through believing in Jesus. Thank you that we can have new life in him. We praise you and glorify you uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.